So thank you all for joining us for this very special talk by Professor Madhav Gadgil, uh, India's most distinguished ecologist and a person who has been a close friend and collaborator of mine for many decades. Uh, I could speak for an hour and a half on Madhav, but I won't. I drawing on the many decades of friendship and interaction and collaboration and shared trips in different parts of India and indeed the world. Uh, one of our most interesting uh, conversations was on a hillside in uh, in actually Bellagio in Italy 40 years ago, where he gave a long talk on his love for the Western Ghats, which is which will feature very much in the book he's working on, which is uh, an intellectual autobiography. So first, basically the brief CV, Madhav was born in Pune. Uh, his first degree was in Pune, then he did a master's in the Institute of Science in Mumbai, specializing in fisheries research. From where he went to Harvard, where he did a PhD in ecology, in mathematical ecology, and several of his papers from that period are citation classics, which means they've been cited more than 500 or 1000 times. But unlike many other Indians uh, with PhDs from foreign degrees, he and his wife, Solochana, a very distinguished applied mathematician, one of our leading experts on the monsoon, who we should also get to speak at Kriya soon, came back to India and actually came back without a job. They were what was called pool officers in the CSIR, which was just you hang around till you get a job. Then they were headhunted by the visionary director of the Indian Institute of Science, Professor Satish Dhawan, who was arguably the most influential director IISC ever had, and certainly the most important nurturer and builder of our space program. So two great achievements uh, to Professor Dhawan's uh, uh, credit. Uh, and uh, he recognized the brilliance and originality of Madhav and Solochna, and they were hired by the Institute of Science, where they spent the rest of their professional career. Madhav established the Center for Ecological Sciences. Uh, uh, Solochna went on to establish the Center for Atmospheric Sciences. I think it's now called the Center for Oceanic and Atmospheric Scientists. Scientists, and it's been uh, my great privilege to know Solochna also as a friend. Madhav as a collaborator. So I'll say a little bit about Madhav as a collaborator. We wrote two books together in the early 90s, This Fisher Land and Ecological History of India, which was published in 1992, and Ecology and Equity, The Use of Abuse of Nature in Contemporary India, which was published three years later. And I am uh, 15, 16 years younger than Madhav. I was actually a fresh PhD when we started working. In fact, I was just doing my PhD when we started collaborating. And first of all, I want to say something about those books. Some of them are still read. They're still, all of them, both of them are still in print. And they still provoke debate and argument and analysis. And all of you know that I'm by no means a modest man. So let me say this. Every original idea in each of those books is mother's. So the idea of resource catchment in fisher land, or the idea of omnivores ecosystems and ecological refugees in ecology and equity, the intellectual framework is completely mother's. Uh, I certainly rewrote quite a lot of his prose. I think that that, that, that even except, of course, I supplied some uh, a fair amount of historical materials. But it was a genuine collaboration between two people from different disciplines. You know, uh, a sociologist turned historian, an ecologist who had moved from mathematical ecology to field ecology. So, in a sense, we may we were kind of practicing some sort of interwoven learning, to use Kriya's catchphrase, and. What is extraordinary about Madhav is how democratic and egalitarian he was in his intellectual orientation. I had come to working with him after working in Kolkata, which has a very, had then and probably has a very feudal academic culture. And actually the more left-wing you are, were in Kolkata, the more feudal you were. You know, Marxists would get uh, uh, their research students to do all their work, including babysitting and other such, 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 sort of stuff. And they could not take an intellectual argument. They, a Marxist intellectual giant would lay down the line and you would have to obediently follow it and enact it and further it in your work. And this is probably true of non-Marxists in Delhi and other places too. So in a feudal intellectual culture, uh, which is very, very much the case in India in the 1980s, Madhav's egalitarian open-minded approach and willingness to be convinced uh, that he might be wrong. One of... Um, uh, the areas in which I was able to convince him that he was wrong was actually in applying the ideas of a very, very great scientist who died recently, one of Madhav's mentors, E.O. Wilson. And it was an extraordinarily uh, happy 
and productive collaboration, this, apart from the books we produced. And I learned many lessons from Madhav. One was, of course, uh, respect for rigor and analysis. And I'll just tell you one lesson I learned from Madhav and the young intellectuals in this room, I should be aware of this. Now, Madhav uh, is uh, a scientist with a public conscience. He's also a scientist with a profound, there are many scientists with a public conscience, and I'll come to the public conscience a bit in a minute. minute. But what is unique about Madhav is he's the, he knows the lives of ordinary Indians inside out. You know, he has walked with herders and shepherds, he's fished with fishers, uh, he has lived, uh, you know, in remote parts of the Northeast and the Himalaya, along with peasants and tribals, uh, and so on. And his zest for fieldwork is quite extraordinary. I mean, he's been marooned for two years without doing fieldwork. He might have, I think, uh, will, uh, celebrated his 80th birthday later this year. But several years ago, when he was in his mid-70s, he insisted I come to Goa. I mean, I'm a very reluctant field worker. I prefer the archive to the field. And his zest for fieldwork is quite extraordinary. So here is a person who is completely engaged and is willing to make the most arduous journeys and treks at his time of life. The other thing about being publicly engaged is Madhav is one of the lessons he taught me very early on and allow me to recollect this is when we were colleagues in the Indian Institute of Science in 1987 or 88. And there was a new nuclear power plant coming up in the Western Ghats in Kaga. And I opposed nuclear energy. And there was a petition going around and I took it to Madhav. And I said, Madhav, sign it. He said, Ram, I will sign petitions to democratize forest management, to make biodiversity conservation more than about large species, to enhance the compensation given to victims of crop raiding, and so on and so forth. But because I have studied forests and biodiversity, if you, as a scholar, engage in public debate and argument related to questions on which you have studied, don't become an all-purpose petition signer. And so, and that's a profoundly important lesson that I learned. And I'm still, to the extent possible, practicing it. So last year, when there was a farmer struggle going on, I was asked to speak at various fora, a year before last to last, and sign. And I said, uh, uh, no. But they said, sir, you protested against the CA Act. You were, uh, you were, the police picked you up. I said, look, I'm a biographer of Gandhi. I know something about Hindu-Muslim harmony. I know nothing about agriculture, so I cannot sign your petition. This is the lesson that Madhav taught me, which I may have imperfectly learned, but which I would like to pass on uh, to my younger colleagues in Korea, that by, if your scholarship and your understanding of society and nature impels you to participate in public debate, to seek to uh, shape public debate, to take public positions, by all means do so, but only to the extent that you have a deep and serious understanding of the problem at hand. You know, I think there is a tendency, I dare say, particularly in amongst uh, some scholars in the humanities, actually maybe even more particularly among NRI intellectuals to sign any petition that comes to their desk. So I think this is something among the uh, lessons of my scholarly vocation that I've learned from Madhav. What I've learned from him about Nature, ecology, society, politics would fill a whole encyclopedia. So I'm really, really grateful and honored uh, to be introducing Madhav today. And over to you. Thanks, Ram. Uh, thank you very much for that most flattering introduction. Uh, may I now have the PowerPoint presentation because I will speak as I go along, uh, along with the PowerPoint presentation. So the topic is. Uh, that I want to speak on is India's Environment Development Conundrum, which is uh, has been a hot matter of debate for last uh, maybe 50 years. Uh, I became aware of this conundrum in 1956 when I was all of 14 years old. Next slide, please. The, may I have the next slide, please? One of uh, the first vivid experience of public life uh, being conducted in Maharashtra was for me the 
1956 to elections to the Lok Sabha. These were very vigorously fought elections and for the main opposition to the Congress was from the Peasant and Workers Party. And Keshorav Jede, who was the candidate, was a powerful speaker. And one of the issues was this Koida hydroelectric reservoir. This was a very major reservoir uh, coming up on the Western Ghats. And Koida was the major tributary of Krishna River. So that the issue was that now farmers in the Krishna Basin will be denied the benefit of the waters of Koida, which they had been enjoying all along, on which they were very much dependent. And uh, they were talking about uh, Nehru uh, not following the ideals that he talks about, pays lip service to the Gandhian ideals of uh, peasants being at the center, uh, the central focus of development in modern India. And this uh, betrayal of Nehru uh, by uh, of Gandhian ideals and of peasants by Nehru was a major attack that Keshav J. Day launched on the Congress uh, party. Now, at that point, nobody was talking about, this is uh, uh, 1952, as I said, about environmental issues or destruction of nature or of forests. It, I was, in a way, well, I was by, in many ways very fortunate because I had a father, D.R. Gangil, who was an economist, who was also very much uh, interested in bird watching. He was a personal friend of Salim Ali, and he was interested in nature and hiking on the Western Ghats. In fact, uh, uh, from the age of whatever, three or four, he introduced me to the um, charms of the Western Ghats. In 1956, there was a meeting of Maharashtra Irrigation Commission, of which he was a member at Koina Hydroelectric uh, Power uh, Site. And on, at that meeting, on the way, in fact, uh, we saw uh, the forest of the Koina Valley. It was at that point still whatever was not uh, being submerged, very rich forest. And we got down and my father uh, looked for, I uh, looked at the forest and watched the, um, he always carried binoculars with him when he was around and we watched the birds and he talked to the peasants who were walking by. He was very much involved with peasants and their development. Uh, he had been, uh, in fact, as early as 1951, uh, instrumental in setting up of the first uh, cooperative sugar mill in Maharashtra at Pravaranagar. So, uh, af after that meeting of the Irrigation Commission in the evening, I saw him for the first time depressed. He, is, he was always a cheerful person. And he said, that, uh, yes, Madhav, I see that we want uh, electrical uh, power. Uh, we want that to drive progress. Next slide, please. Sorry. Next slide, please. To drive our progress. But may I have the next slide, please? Uh, but, uh, yes, okay. Uh, but should we be paying these costs? And it was very interesting, uh, uh, these issues, because he had been a student of Arthur Cecil Pigou at uh, Cambridge University. And uh, Pigou, uh, I, I, I don't know much economics, but from whatever I have little picked up here and there, but uh, uh, we had Pigou's books and Baba talked about it, that he was the man who, uh, talked about the concept, introduced the concept of externality. 
that is a cost or benefit that affects a third party who did not choose to incur that. And this is a concept central to modern welfare economics, I understand, and environmental economics. And Tigu also, while talking about social welfare, demonstrated that social welfare is enhanced by reducing economic inequalities. So my father was very aware of these issues that uh, these costs of the, uh, the benefits of electricity would go to some party, whereas the costs of generating that electricity would be borne by others, the uh, peasants primarily, and especially those who would be displaced. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So that is how, as I said, I became very con conscious of the environment development conundrum as early as 1956, uh, perhaps much before it began to be talked about in a broader fashion. Uh, uh, then I had a vivid understanding of these costs a few years later uh, when I actually went to one of the villages who were rehabilitated on the uh, plateau uh, after being submerged by the Koyna Valley. And this was a village called Gundisa Mal. And the Gundisa Mal was uh, inhabited by people who cultivated rice and maintained very substantial number of buffaloes in the Koyna Valley, it was a prosperous village. Uh, the village was called Deur. It was a very prosperous village. And here they were resettled on Gundi Samar. And we reached there in the evening and had a very frugal meal. And then the whole settlement was enveloped in dark. They could not afford even to light even a single kerosene lantern. That is how much pauperized they had become. And as I said, this really brought home to me the way uh, this development was being uh, uh, pushed forward at the cost of the weak and poor very clearly and benefiting the smaller number of much better off parts of Indian community. Next slide, please. Uh, as Ram has been talking, I am a scientist first and foremost, and uh, very proud, I may say, of my profession as a scientist. And I try to practice two edicts of science, uh, which uh, actually uh, um, Ram mentioned by Guru at Harvard, Edward Wilson. Uh, he first uh, drew my attention to these uh, when I was. 24 years old, I guess, at that time, a young uh, graduate student at Harvard. Uh, one of them is uh, by Bernal, who was the founder of modern molecular biology, uh, and in fact, uh, of all of biotechnology. He is the, uh, ultimately, that all that owes to Bernal. Now, he says, science is a systematic enterprise of skepticism. You must doubt and examine everything uh, without taking anything for granted. And Whitehead, who is a, a well-known mathematical philosopher and mathematician, says science anchors itself to objective facts, however unpalatable. So I have all my life, I guess, mentioned many unpalatable facts. And the Western Ghat Ecology Expert Panel report was full of such unpalatable facts, <clears throat> which is why it drew such a, a violently negative response from powers that be. The next slide, please. Next slide, please. Whereas, of course, the whole bureaucracy and the power structure is engaged in obfuscation of not letting people get at uh, honestly at information and uh, continually attempting to 
mislead them in many ways. And uh, the uh, science, of course, is very different. Uh, it is an open profession. Uh, Salim Ali, who is regarded, and of course he was one of the great scientists of India, he never got a college degree because he could never pass BSc uh, because he uh, hated mathematics anyway. So he had no college degree. Nevertheless, he was honored as a scientist. But official dub is constantly attempting to mystify science, restricted practice, and benefits to chosen few. And the wing of bureaucracy with which I have become most familiar over the years because of my scientific interest is forestry. And it is the worst. I think of the bureaucratic wings of India, um, apparatus of India, it is the most anti-people and anti-science uh, uh, spirit that uh, inflicts uh, in the infest uh, forest department. And it has many implications. I will talk about them. Next slide, please. So let's uh, look a little bit at the origin of this forest management in India. When the British came in, uh, India's village community, of course, had been plagued by many inequalities and evils such as um, untouchability and suppression of women and much other, many other evils. But fact remains that they are guarded and sustainably used the living resources of their common lands. So uh, early British travelers talk eloquently about India being an ocean of trees teeming with wildlife. Next slide, please. And uh, while uh, British managed to suppress uh, all this, uh, take over the village com community lands and uh, dis um, uh, completely uh, overuse the tree resources and destroy, in the sense, the greenery of India, uh, Portuguese could not do that. Portuguese also tried, when they conquered Goa, to dismantle the local village community management. But they found that that uh, cost them too much in terms of agricultural revenue. So they allowed the Gaukari or Kovidudaj system to persist. And that is why Goa remains, even today, despite the attempts to the contrary by the forest department following 1961, to uh, convert its uh, forests, uh, overuse them and convert them to monoculture. Nevertheless, it remains uh, a green island and, of course, therefore, a great attraction for the tourists. Next slide, please. So, what did the British do? On conquering India, they were hungry to drain India's resources. So, they took over village community lands and the device they used to take over all village community lands was the forest department. And uh, Ram and I have written in our books, there is this uh, correspondence with Madras uh, revenue officials. Some of them said that, what are you talking about conservation? Forest department is merely confiscated the resources uh, under the guise of conservation. And that's what it had, it has been doing. Next slide, please. Very influential in molding the forest policy were the British tea and coffee planters, because they were very much uh, interested in forested areas to set up their estates uh, in Assam uh, uh, and. Uh, then uh, on the Western Ghats, uh, especially uh, in uh, the Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Kerala parts of Western Ghats. But of course, many of these British tea and coffee planters were very enthusiastic uh, naturalists and gifted writers. And as I said, my father had been interested in bird watching and we had 
all the old volumes of Bombay Natural History Society, which I read with uh, great interest when I was a schoolboy. And uh, they wrote uh, brilliantly. So I was familiar with and had been reading the writings of uh, especially two of them, R.C. Morris and uh, from uh, the Bilger Rangan Mehta's and uh, Eastern Ghats uh, of uh, Karnataka, just off the Western Ghats, uh, uh, and EPG, a tree planter of Assam. Now, uh, they were Salib Ali's great friends, and their predecessors had pleaded in, uh, while the forest policy was being drafted, that shifting cultivation must be banned because there are letters from the Tea Planters Association that unless we ban shifting cultivation, we will never get labor for our plantations and pauperize the people, uh, throw them off the land and convert them into basically slaves. I mean, I don't want to go into too much, but personal experiences uh, of R.C. Morris's plantation, this great friend of Salim Ali, who was also a very gifted writer on natural history. Uh, I have visited his plantation just after he had left for Britain. And the Bukadam and the plantation, I chatted with him. The Bukadam told me that he missed the great old grand old times of uh, British rule when he could stand with a whip and whip this labor into shape to get them to perform. And after independence, he said, now. I have to exert so much, it is awful. Anyway, and there are many other descriptions uh, uh, of the way slave, the way they treated these people as slaves. Next slide, please. And uh, the point I want to make is uh, that uh, it was these planters, R.C. Morris and E.P.G., who were great friends of Salim Ali, uh, and who were, along with him, the first members of the Indian Board of Wildlife in 1952. Uh, and the other members were Maharajas. So it was Salim Ali, these tea and coffee planters and Maharajas, all of whom regarded the common people of India with contempt, who were responsible for shaping of uh, forest policy. And see, in a series of articles in 1950s, E.P. Gee wrote about the shape uh, the nature conservation policy should take. And uh, he sketched what came to be uh, passed as a Wildlife Protection Act in 1972. Although he had passed away by that time, nevertheless, the whole outline is very much there in his articles. And anyway, but this began to be talked about when uh, he was a member of the first Indian Board of Wildlife. Uh, even today, one sees how badly the labor is being treated. There have been these uh, series of disasters, landslides in Kerala, where the plantation labor uh, forced to live in miserable huts. Next slide, please. In the gullies of the stream, where nobody should be forced to stay. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is the labor camp uh, before and after. Anyway, uh, uh, no need to go back to that slide. They have uh, crushed uh, in the landslide. Yeah, next slide, please. Next slide, please. So now who are the supporters of this Wildlife Protection Act, which has brought the whole of the country because earlier, Forest Department had control over only the sub-23% of the country, which was uh, legally forest uh, land, uh, though much of it was, uh, as Deber had once uh, reported in 1950s, treeless forests, but it was forest land. And uh, now the control, their grip has extended over the whole country with Wildlife Protection Act. And there is strong support to Wildlife Protection Act from certain segments of the population, 
particularly the uh, English educated middle classes, uh, some from, uh, not that all of them are vegetarians, uh, but uh, pr uh, those who are engaged in trade and industry and who are the beneficiaries of uh, this whole uh, way that uh, the common people of India are being put down and resources made available to them. And uh, one of the main beneficiaries is giant communities. I came into contact with them for the first time when uh, I was working at the West Coast paper mill in Dandeli, owned by Mangans, who were giants, uh, and uh, who were uh, main beneficiaries of forest departments, subsidizing them and suppressing the original beneficiaries of natural resources. So they provide a very strong support uh, to the Wildlife Protection Act, uh, which has extended the forest departments to a grip over the entire countryside, uh, targeting people traditionally dependent on hunting as part of their subsistence strategy. And today, uh, they are going beyond uh, Peasants, of course, uh, majority of India's peasants were dependent on hunting uh, wild pigs, especially uh, for their uh, as an important protein source for them. But uh, now the fishing community, who is today uh, and to this day, uh, hunting community really, they hunt uh, uh, the fish. And Wildlife Protection Act is now being used as a weapon against the fishing community also. Uh, there are fish which are now on the schedule list and uh, they are being caught and uh, completely improperly uh, jailed actually in Orissa as fishing a uh, scheduled species. One uh, zoological survey of India, a friend of mine pointed out that uh, Actually, the species they caught was not on the schedule. It was a different species. And Forest Department registered a complaint against him for hampering the work of public servants. Anyway, so now uh, the peasants, of course, and their hunting of wild pig and such other uh, game is uh, not only targeted, but even the fishermen are being targeted. Next slide, please. Next slide. And, and what is the performance of this forest department? The urban conservationists have the myth that they are interested in and conserving the forest, but this is a completely complete falsehood. They are one of the most uh, corrupt and uh, destructive agencies uh, as early as 1972. I was uh, I studied the sacred grubs of the Western Ghats, and you can see this one of a ten hectare grub in a village uh, called Mangao, uh, very close to the hills of from Pune district, and uh, the only tree growth is in that sacred grub and some trees around the village land, but the rest of it is completely uh, wiped out. It was all reserved forest. And there, um, we spent several days in the field there and talking to people and understanding. It was at that time uh, when the uh, uh, this uh, this is actually the roads reach this area with the Panshet Dam, which is a major water supply for Pune city. And when the, uh, the roads reached uh, at that time in the 1950s. Charcoal was the major source of fuel for the Pune people and charcoal merchants and irrigation engineers and forest department people uh, roamed the villages and persuaded the villagers to uh, sell their trees for pittance. But more than that, the entire reserve forest was by please. 
May I have the next slide, please? So, the forest policy of 1952. Again, I am afraid that Salib Ali was very much behind this drawing of this forest policy. As I mentioned, uh, I got to know him uh, at a very young age because my father was a friend of his even uh, well before I was born and uh, uh, was an enthusiastic bird watcher. And I was charmed by Salim Ali and decided to become a field ecologist primarily because of his influence. And throughout his life, we remained in constant touch. I went on very many field trips with him. And he was a wonderful companion and a wonderful uh, instructor for me on bird life of India. But uh, uh, he was a completely with his tree and coffee planter friends in considering the common people of India as enemies of nature. And this policy, uh, was, uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru greatly respected Salibani. This policy, uh, influenced in good part by him, reaffirmed the hegemony of the forest department. And what was forest department doing? The, I, I got to study this West Coast paper mill in uh, Karnataka because uh, the basket weavers of Karnataka and Gherav Murarrao Ghorpade, who was a very sensitive finance minister, uh, saying that the paper mill was destroying their source of livelihood. And so he asked me as an independent investigator to study the forest management and in particularly bamboo management in Karnataka. And because of his influence, I had access to a whole lot of information. I spent uh, four full years at West Coast Paper Mill in the field studying bamboo management. Uh, on the very second day I was there, I saw them. Uh, they had illegally enclosed large forest areas and they were beating up displaced villagers when they entered what was still that time their own forest. And uh, the mill had, of course, no right to uh, fence it and throw them out. And forest department was, uh, of course, with them in beating these people up. Uh, and, uh, I won't go into detail, but uh, there was clear evidence that bamboo was rapidly exhausted through overuse and unregulated use, and mill polluted air and water with impunity. Uh, and it was the recipient of incredible subsidies. The basket weavers were buying bamboo at 1,500 rupees per ton, and the mill was being given bamboo by the government at one and a half rupees per ton. 1,000 the price what the basket weavers were playing. So what was this? And of course, uh, they paid nothing for polluting the air and water. This was crony capitalism, as it has been called, uh, which is squeeze the nature and the poor to fatten the rich. The next slide, please. So uh, what I want to submit to you is that this is the great blight on India. This is behind the uh, whole false dichotomy today being uh, postulated between environment and development. I have good friends, uh, uh, I may mention his name, he's a very nice chap and very well-meaning, but he was Vijay Kelkar who retired as finance secretary to government of India. He's all in favor of economic reform, which are giving huge subsidies to industry. And he is all against populism, which is giving any kind of benefits to the poor people of the country. So uh, the discussion of uh, this crony capitalism it talks about the fact that business are not thriving through free enterprise, but with money amassed through collusion between business class and political class. And this is so clear in India. And their enterprise is only manipulating state power to obtain various favors. 
So entrepreneurship and innovative practices which seek to reward risk are stifled. And uh, it uh, corrupts public service, economic, political, social ideals, which is very much the case in present day India. Next slide, please. Uh, and we keep talking about USA and China, but what we should think about are Asian countries like Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, or European countries like Germany, Switzerland, Austria, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and so on. These are all industrially advanced countries, both the Asian and uh, European, and they diligently protect their environment and they diligently protect their democracy. And it is through uh, attacking our environment uh, increasingly so year by year and democracy that we are remaining industrially, whatever we may claim, uh, a very poor performing country. And of course, a country which is losing more and more of its democratic freedoms. Next slide, please. So, uh, coming back to Salim Ali, uh, as I said, I had wonderful time with him throughout my life, but I always had uh, this misgiving about his prejudices against the common people of India. And in Bharatpur, uh, where he had been working for all a uh, long number of years, uh, he had still, while he knew a great deal about the birds, no broader understanding of ecosystem. He was prejudiced that banning the traditional access of villagers to and their buffaloes would improve the wetland as a bird habitat. Uh, at his Insistence, Indira Gandhi declared it a national park. Seven villagers were killed. But it turned out that he was completely mistaken. That buffalo grazing was actually keeping a water-loving glass uh, spalum stick up under check. And without grazing, the wetland became very shallow and made, made it a much worse habitat for the water birds which is what he thought that it would improve with his uh, habitat. And what I am afraid is unbecoming to a scientist is this information, these studies I am aware of because I was following up uh, with his group, uh, uh, what was going on in Bharatpur. Uh, this information has never been made public and people are not aware of this uh, serious misunderstanding for which Salim Ali was responsible. Next slide, please. So, with the kind of the grip of the forest department over the entire country, India has become a cauldron of conflicts. This lady, I, I, it touches me very profoundly because this lady comes from a village in Ganchiroli district, uh, uh, in, since 1991 till today, I have been in touch with those people. I have done a lot of field work. I have lived with them. And she was a relative of one of the uh, young people who is a friend of mine. And I have roamed around in the forest uh, freely uh, where she was killed. But now, the with the 50 years of this to my mind, completely irrational protection to wildlife. Tigers have increased in number and thousands of people are being killed by wildlife and wild animals. Uh, and losses of crops and property are running into thousands of crores. Uh, and people are not free to defend themselves against marauding animals. And this lady was patrolling the community forest resource, which is uh, rightfully assigned to the people uh, because of the Forest Rights Act and was killed by a tiger. Next slide, please. May I have the next slide?
So, what is this Wildlife Protection Act? I have consulted uh, two good friends, one retired as Director General of Police of Maharashtra and another as a, a Chief Justice of Aurangabad High Court. And they say the way Wildlife Protection Act is for, formed, it is violative of the Constitution because Indian Penal Code, uh, Sections 100 and 103, sanction voluntary killing of human beings. But you cannot voluntarily kill a wild pig if it attacks you or destroys your property. This is, of course, they said, unconstitutional. Next slide, please. So, what is the uh, way forward? As I said, the countries which have the most abundant wildlife populations in the world and countries which are highest ranking in the world in terms of their environmental protection performance as well as their ranking, world ranking in happiness are these Scandinavian countries. And uh, they have this rational uh, approach. They say that wildlife, uh, just like other biological resources, are is a renewable resource and we should use it wisely. Of course, you should not uh, harvest it beyond the limit, but within limit, by all means, harvest it. Uh, use the game meat. You can sell it on the open market and uh, uh, let local people make the detailed decisions about how much to harvest, and of course, if it attacks you, as tigers have done or wild, wild pigs have done or gaur have done, then you can uh, certainly kill it, and you are not a criminal as Wildlife Protection Act of India makes it to be. And of course, uh, uh, I have several good friends who enjoy, uh, especially when you said the moose meat, and uh, they take licenses and hunt moose, uh, uh, as permitted on their license, and their uh, 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 preserves in their houses are full of moose meat, and I enjoy venison, and I have had very good uh, moose uh, venison meals uh, with these friends. Next slide, please. And, and I think it is, it is the right thing to do. Next slide, please. So, but with the kind of regime that we have, for common people, environmental protection is strangled hold of forest department. So they reject all environmental conservation efforts. And it is this rejection which is taken advantage of by those who want to na destroy nature to make a quick buck. Next slide, please. Uh, our Western Ghat Ecology Expert Panel report had very strongly asked for a very different approach, but it was misinterpreted. Next slide, please. And the consequences are these landslides which have been afflicting Kerala in recent years and Maharashtra also. In recent years, the Konkan area had uh, major landslides killing large number of people. Now, these are all in areas which our Western Ghat panel had considered ecologically highly sensitive. We did not have a one uh, sort of suit fits all approach. We had uh, said that certain things should not be done only in the highly sensitive uh, zone. And that also after people's uh, uh, looking at the recommendations. But uh, all these villages uh, which uh, have experienced these landslides, they all come in that ecologically highly sensitive zone. And interestingly, uh, the worst uh, in the, uh, this year was this Kuttikkal in Kottayam district. And the Kuttikkal has been uh, agitating against illegal rock quarries on hills above their village for 10 years. And they have 
a nearby village had prepared a proper documentation and the high court had upheld it, but they were made to withdraw their resolutions against quarry by vested interest saying that if you do that, you will come under the tyranny of the forest department. So this tyranny of forest department is being used to completely turn people, common people of uh, the country against any environmental protection. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. This is, I was talking that uh, it is the vested interest. The other uh, um, example I'm very fond, familiar with is Goa. Ram mentioned that. Uh, by insisting that he come to Goa, uh, where mining, uh, which is uh, obviously a great beneficiary of this crony capitalistic system, uh, he has, uh, uh, Shah Commission has said that they have amassed 35,000 crores of illegal money. And uh, now that with uh, the kind of a, a discontent, People were uh, uh, um, have uh, made them to stop uh, uh, mining, and common people are happy. But the government is again using uh, this information to claim that the common people are very sad because they have lost a lot of employment through the mines. Next slide, please. So, coming back to now our own great beneficiaries of this crony capitalistic system. Uh, over the last two years, uh, the nine billionaires have been listed as having uh, registered the greatest increase in their wealth. At top is Elon Musk, uh, whom I admire greatly. He is one of the world's great technology innovators. And uh, amongst other things, he has these uh, electric vehicles and a solar city, which promotes solar power. Uh, both of them are shining examples. These are innovation, enterprise, efficiency, and employment generation through ancillary uh, production and ancillary economic activities. So is this, he, Zia uh, Pong, of China are involved in electric manufacture of electric vehicles. Next slide, please. Number seven is our old Gautam Adadi. And what is his performance in this enterprise efficiency, innovation, and uh, employment generation? He, along with the two other big uh, A's of India, the Ambadis and the Vedantas Agarwal, they owned coal berths at Vasco da Gama uh, port. Uh, use of coal is increasing greenhouse gas production and adversely impacting agriculture and fisheries, which are the two major sources of employment for Goa's people. And there has been huge agitation against this in Goa. Uh, which has been completely ignored. And government has, on the contrary, pumped 1,000 crores to develop a railway line. Note, through the Molem National Park and Abghat Forest, destroying forests solely to support transport of their coal to Karnataka. And Forest Department, what is it doing? It has not protested. It has not... Uh, tried to protect the national parks and reserve forest. It is simply uh, going along with this destruction uh, as part of the ruling clique. Next slide, please. So what do we have today? Lot is all the time talked about. Our great, grandiose infrastructure drive. Dig, burn, and build. That's India's infrastructure drive. So, uh, in Arani's, uh, Arani, Gautam Arani has this very jump port in amongst many other projects in uh, uh, Kerala. 
and it is destroying the livelihoods of large number of fisher folk. Uh, you can see the poor fisher folks uh, are being squeezed right next to the port. And uh, forest construction, stone quarries are proliferating. And most of the stone quarries recorded are illegal. They are making large amounts of money simply without paying any taxes and uh, without uh, uh, being held accountable in any way. They are destroying farmland and water resources and impairing health with very bad air pollution. And one day with the change in the climate that has now started precipitating large super cyclones hitting the West Coast, this Willingham port is likely to be destroyed anyway. Next slide, please. And uh, it is these fisher folk which are now uh, in trouble. They were, in, when the 2018 floods occurred, they were saluted by whole of Kerala as the real heroes, uh, reaching where others could not reach and saved thousands of people. Next slide, please. And amongst other developments, mangrove forests, which are very important for health of fisheries, they have the nursery of fish and uh, prawns, they are being destroyed and buildings like this Maradu apartments is being built in uh, Ernakulam, uh, where the mangrove forest was completely illegally. And uh, there are orders for demolition of these illegal structures. Next slide, please. So, who needs housing? Do these uh, uh, rich uh, who are building these uh, um, seaside, uh, very expensive apartments? Uh, actually, you look at how many people in India are living in slums and how many people are homeless. Uh, a minimum of 0.15% of India's total population is homeless. Probably it is much larger. And no, nothing is coming to these people for uh, improving their welfare, whereas uh, all the investment is going in railways and uh, uh, highways and housing for the rich. Next slide, please. So, uh, with the kind of uh, prevailing atmosphere, none of our industrial products can compete on global stage. I had the privilege of spending some time in South Korea, uh, which now their products are uh, um, completely captured much of Indian market, uh, but there was nothing, uh, nothing, no Indian product on the South Korean, uh, in the South Korean market. Uh, next slide, please. And there are many uh, examples showing that uh, taking good care of environment has been uh, economically beneficial. Uh, Finland's paper industry now makes more money selling zero effluent technology than paper, and we are buying in India, our paper mills are buying uh, machinery, old paper manufactured machinery, junked by uh, the uh, Europeans at uh, rock bottom price and polluting more and more. Next slide, please. And Japan's success owes itself to when the Minamata disaster of 1965 made Japan past stringent anti-pollution laws, which were uh, implemented, of course, in Japan. And uh, they, one of the side benefits was their cars became highly fuel efficient. And with the 1973 oil shock, they captured the world market. And today they continue to dominate the world market uh, 
along with South Korea and a few other countries. Next slide, please. So, what is the way ahead? Let us not talk about any country, if we want to compare uh, any European country, they have a different uh, history, that's fine. But South Korea is a democratic country like India, and it has a population denser than India, and it was largely destroyed in the 1953-55 Korean War. But uh, as I said, I had this opportunity, the Korea, the Ecological Society had invited me to visit and give some lectures. And uh, uh, they said that they began by building strong basic education and public health system, and only then went on to build the strong industries. Uh, they know very little English, and anyway, they have no interest in learning English, and no interest in migrating to USA. And with their uh, strengths, they have uh, you know, uh, controlled the current pandemic far more efficiently than India. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the Seoul National University, anyway, uh, which is uh, um, producing all these innovative enterprises which are efficient and which generate employment. Next slide, please. And, uh, you know, uh, next slide, please. These are the many uh, South Korean products which are capturing the Indian market. Next slide, please. So just to compare their performance, in the environmental performance index, globally, India is at rock bottom, 177 out of 180, whereas Korea, South Korea is much higher up, 60 out of 180. In the happiness index, again, India is at rock bottom, 139 out of 149. South Korea is 62 out of 149. In per capita GDP, India is little better world, uh, uh, globally, 122 out of 2, 112. But uh, South Korea is 10. And the difference is that in terms of balance of payment, India is again at rock bottom, highly negative balance of payment, whereas Korea has, South Korea is highly positive balance of payment. Madam, can you uh, finish in the next... Right? Can you finish in the next three, four minutes because there are lots of questions? Sure, sure, sure. And level of hunger in India is, uh, that is where India is high, uh, almost at the top. Next slide, please. So what we need is this infrastructure, health and education. And that is what we should uh, focus on and stop building all this uh, uh, current infrastructure, which is promoting, among other things, stone quarries and sand mining, degrading environment, and accompanied by high levels of illegalities and corrupt practices. Next slide, please. But fortunately for us, India is a vibrant democracy, and we have many provisions which people at grassroots can use. Uh, they are motivated to protect the environment and they have, many, they have many living traditions of conservation. So if they can play their rightful role in our democracy, that is where we will move and that is what we should think of. Next slide, please. Fortunately, in the modern information age, uh, despite the very poor education they have received, now the young people are uh, no more hampered by the lack of knowledge, especially of English language, because uh, with the whole lot of facilities like Google Translate and all sorts of apps, they can overcome this uh, hurdle and they are building vibrant social networks, which will, I think in coming years, 
mobilize the common people of India to liquidate the system that is wrongfully blaming them for all destruction of nature. And together they will raise their voices and demand that polluters pay real prices of polluting the environment and stop being provided countries natural resources with huge subsidies so that economic prosperity will be shared by all Indians and will who we can come to enjoy in uh, living in a clean biodiversity rich environment. Next slide. Uh, and Dalai Lama says that caring for nature must go hand in hand with respect for fellow human beings. What That is what we need in India. The uh, those who are currently in favorable position must come to respect uh, the people, uh, the rest of the masses of the people, and then we will progress. Next slide, please. I, I am through. Thank you, Rob. And I hope we still have some time for questions and answers. Thank you, Bharat. I think Bharat has some questions from the audience. Bharat, go ahead. Thanks, Ram. Uh, Professor Gadgil, I, I have a few questions from the audience. So I can read out uh, two or three and then uh, you could respond to them. Uh, sure. So the, so, yeah. Great. So the first is uh, from Yadugiri, who wants to know uh, what uh, your dream wildlife protection policy and forest department will look like. And uh, on, a, on a related note uh, with your question about education, what do you feel is the role of private educational institutions to provide uh, good education to India's youth? The second question is from Leela Prasad, uh, who asks about, uh, uh, she, she's curious about with governance being a problem in India, how feasible is rational hunting in our country like uh, not countries? So, uh, may, I, may I suggest that I answer that one by one? Uh, so, sure. uh, the last one I may forget before I answer. Sure. Sure. Uh, sure. Why, why wildlife uh, protection forest pol policy is modeled on uh, Australia, I'm sorry, uh, on the Scandinavia, that uh, we have a decentralized system of deciding on what to protect and what not to protect, and how much to harvest, and we should systematically harvest uh, the excess. Uh, I did not go into details, but uh, uh, it is very clear that uh, with 50 years of uh, uh, mindless to my mind, protection to the wildlife, their numbers have skyrocketed and the wild animals have lost all fear of people and we are in serious difficulty. And uh, this we should change. Uh, we should have some uh, uh, involve the Gram Sabhas, the local communities in deciding on what they want. See, people in Goa are up in our saying that monkeys are destroying our horticulture. Uh, horticulture is very important to Goa and monkeys should be declared vermin said they should be killed. Now, if the Goans want monkeys to be killed, then they should be killed. And uh, uh, it is not as if India is short of monkeys. Uh, clearly, we have too many monkeys. There is plenty of evidence of that, including in Delhi and everywhere else. And uh, uh, what I do not like at all is this uh, vegetarians claim that they are spiritually more advanced human beings. I think I mean, in India, I have lived with them. There are many communities who eat monkeys. In the Northeast, for example, in the central India, amongst the Rajgons. Now, if they eat monkeys and you want, Govans want monkeys to be culled, then uh, nicely hygienically pack and present them this uh, meat. Or if you uh, have even more than that, then sell it to Chinese. A Chinese will buy it happily, they eat monkeys. So, this whole thing should be re-looked at in a very different fashion. As far as the education uh, is concerned, uh, uh, public education up to 12th standard or so, uh, certainly let private education be uh, involved in that. 
but there should be very good facilities accessible to all at essentially no cost uh, up to the 10th standard at least. The higher education, anyway, even in uh, many of these countries like South Korea, the private institutions are involved and I am all in favor. Fine, uh, good private institutions, may, by all means, let them be involved in higher education and even in the primary and middle school. But uh, that should not mean that uh, these uh, common people who cannot easily afford are denied. Uh, what was the, uh, the uh, next question? So Leela Prasad asks, uh, with governance being a problem in India, how feasible is rational hunting in our country that is not different? No, no, governance is a problem. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, those who are governing us are amongst the most mindless and corrupt people. So, uh, allowing people at grassroots to play a role is much better than uh, these uh, uh, corrupt uh, bureaucrats or politicians, and, uh, as if they are the enlightened uh, class who can make better decisions. That is, I, I completely uh, reject that argument. Uh, so, Ram, that's that's about the number of questions I have. So, if uh, you have one or Mahesh has one, please go ahead. You're mute. Mahesh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, Professor Gadgil, I had a different question. Uh, you had very rightly pointed out uh, Jawaharlal Nehru giving emphasis to heavy industry uh, and capital goods such as the paper mills and dams. Uh, no one can differ with that and its negative implications are very clear, certainly by 70s, 80s. But uh, that seems to have been a point of consensus of leaders of most of the newly independent countries and countries which had more assertive governments. I was thinking of Nasser in Egypt and the Aswan Dam, Mao's China. One can give other examples. So I'm just wondering that at that point of time, did they feel that these heavy industries are vital to protect the political independence with some degree of economic self reliance And while the negative implications are very clear to us today, most of the critics at that time were not in power. And since 1950s, certainly since 60s, we have had several other governments in office. Broadly, most governments seem to have the same belief. So was Nehru simply expressing in his usual very flowery language the views held by most of the statesmen of his time? Not all, but most in India and overseas. Uh, I'm asking this because uh, sometimes in hindsight, things look different from what they may have been then. So I just want to thank you. Yeah, but uh, I mean, as my father was very clear, as I told you, there was no justification for Nehru or anybody else, regardless of whatever he felt, for doing this kind of injustice to people who were being uh, victimized by the projects. And indeed, uh, you know, this Koyana pro project is from 1956 uh, or so. Now, even today, in 2022, there are people who are not being rehabilitated who are suffering worse and worse with years. Now, this is something which uh, certainly uh, no government should have done. Uh, and of course, a uh, uh, lot of destruction of the forest uh, could very well have been avoided. With corruption, there was a lot of destruction of forest. That is also very clear. Now, th these are two things which... Uh, as I said, my father was also very clear about it. In that uh, 1956 must, uh, should not have happened. Bharat, did you have... Uh, oh, yeah, there's a question. Uh, uh. Yeah, I, I had a question, uh, Ram. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, so, go ahead. Uh, Professor, so, Professor Gardil, uh, in, in, your, in your light of the skepticism comment, uh, I've been following the work of Kathleen Morrison who writes about uh, forest degradation, 
caused by the hoysala empire and uh, she she basically uh, to be you know uh, she she basically uh, is skeptical about the uh, about british colonialism being the primary cause of environmental degradation in india and she basically says that uh, india or some parts of india have gone through cyclical forest degradation uh, by the by the powers that were at that time uh, and that forest resources were subjugated to their needs so this this notion of uh, destruction and 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 regeneration is something that has been very clearly seen through the fossil record through the archaeological record and so on and so forth. so i was just wondering uh, what your thoughts are on that no but whatever uh, 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 evidence i have looked at the british played an overwhelming role there is no claim that uh, uh, earlier the rulers uh, did not uh, both the common people and rulers we are not involved in the certain amount of forest destruction uh, the whole colonization of the gangetic plain iravati karve has written this wonderful book called yuganta in which she she talks about how um, the um, pandavas themselves where began the uh, destruction of the forest of the gangetic uh, plain and it proceeded Uh, as uh, time advanced, and certainly uh, government uh, that way rulers were involved. So all that is correct, but nevertheless, British uh, overwhelmingly were responsible. Is also I think very true, and uh, as I said, you can see it in Goa because uh, I am very familiar with Goa uh, and uh, its history and. Uh, Uh, the fact that it has re- it had retained right till certainly 1961 very much uh, its uh, green mantle and after that also by resisting the uh, liquidation of comedy dance it has managed to maintain quite a, 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 a substantial amount of its greenery is a very good proof that. Uh, the community control had worked and has been working there are other examples so i will not uh, agree that uh, the role of the british was not overwhelmingly important i think it was overwhelmingly important uh, that is all uh, all the evidence shows that uh, thank you professor gadgil there are a couple of more questions uh, uh, several questions in the chat box madam i'll just ask them very quickly one is from vasudha kulkarni who says there is a conflict between conservation and development we need to protect biodiversity at the same time certain infrastructure is necessary for people in the area you know is there a framework we can resolve used to resolve this case by case how do we choose which costs are acceptable no no i bet mean, the whole lecture was about this so again i cannot go so i so i would say i would say i would say i mean one of course key take away from your arguments uh i would say there were two i mean what's the if i may i think two important uh, i suppose uh, guidelines one is political decentralization so that you know uh, case by case how do people so rather than the mantrale in mumbai or the vidhan sabha in bangalore or the central government deciding enough decentralization so that there is actual engagement with local people the other i would say is the role of science you know um, uh, rather than bureaucrats scientists so i so would, would that be fair this this would be two key inputs in deciding these costs and how to how how to yeah i i think so i mean uh, the uh, an important example is prachibada in palakkad uh, district in kerala Ah. this uh, this village uh, gram panchayat uh, it uh, had a coca cola factory and the coca cola factory was polluting the ground water and uh, soil and the gram panchayat uh, then asked for this to be looked at there was an inquiry by an expert group which agreed and they actually estimated the damage that the a uh, village uh, had suffered as some 260 crore rupees now 
uh, the uh, Coca Cola factory went to High Court saying that his government, uh, state government, had permitted the uh, factory to operate. Then uh, the Gram Panchayat cannot uh, intervene. The High Court examined and said no. The, at the Gram Panchayat level, they have the right to protect the life and livelihoods of the people, and they must be uh, their decision must stand. And uh, I have been to Plachivada, and if you look at the ground facts, it's very clear that they were very right in doing, claiming what they were claiming. The Kerala legislature, after that, has passed unanimously an act saying that uh, uh, Plachivada people must be paid this 2,260 crores in some 2006 or so. Even today, they have not been paid a single paisa. And uh, government, the Kerala government has been promising, no, no, they will do something. They are spending thousands and thousands of crores on infrastructure. They cannot find 260 crores to play Plachimana people. Uh, this is ridiculous. So as you are saying, my certainly uh, strong uh, uh, faith is in decentralization of the uh, democratic processes. And Kerala itself had uh, the people's planning campaign, which was uh, a big example of actually how to go about it, though it, uh, it, it could not uh, proceed further. But uh, I think that with decentralization and those decision makings being uh, certainly at the Gram Panchayat levels, they are not going to decide on the country's foreign policy. But uh, there is this so-called subsidiarity principle. Whatever can be decided upon appropriately at, uh, at the uh, decentralized level must be de decided by, uh, by them, not by the uh, state governments or central governments. And I think that is certainly, as you are saying, one strong lesson which I uh, endorse. Uh, there are several other questions, but I'll just quickly, I won't, in the interest of time, I think they've been answered. One question by Akash is, is there a country that we can follow that take conservation and development hand in hand? I think Professor Gadgil talked about the Scandinavian countries and South Korea. And I'd say uh, just as a uh, follow up to the countries of examples he gave, uh, unlike the USA, England and Germany and Japan, four great industrial countries, all of whom had major colonies, South Africa, uh, South Korea, Taiwan and the Scandinavian countries have managed to develop harmonized environment without extracting resources from colonies. So in that sense, you know, they may be a good example. Uh, one question from, um, one comment from, um, I think it was, just give me a minute, from K. Vargis. What is your opinion, Professor Gadgil, about mono clonal timber and softwood plantations by the forest department, along with exotic invasive species like lantana, aren't these plantations the cause of driving wildlife out of the forest hence increasing human wildlife conflicts. So briefly answer in, that. In part it is, yes. In part it certainly is. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, in the interest of time, I mean, we, we, we should end now, but I want to make one comment, and that is a, a modest defense of Salimani. Uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, you, it was you, Madhav, who uh, alerted me to an article Salimani wrote uh, maybe in about 1980, where he was shortly before he died, where he said, we have to take the interests of the cultivator and the farmer uh, into consideration when talking about wildlife, we have ignored it. So like many thinking people, he was growing like a scientist, he was changing his mind, maybe not enough. But you know that article, I think it was in Hornbill magazine, where he wrote this article about uh, uh, how, uh, you know, how the interests of the illiterate cultivator and peasant is never taken into account when designing wildlife sanctuaries, and we should take it into account. Maybe so partly this, was your influence, may have been partly his conversations with you, just, but just, he was changing his mind. <laughs> I agree. Just a small comment. In fact, in that article, he says, Murarji Desai called me and asked me this question. So I agreed. Now, okay. and he wrote that article in Hornbill. Interestingly enough, there were others from Bombay Natural History Society who said to me, 
Huh? He could never have written that article. You must have written it for him <laughs> and forced him to publish it in his name. Huh. So I, I leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, thank you, Vajra. This has been a wonderful presentation. And thank you for the audience for such great questions. Thank you, Bharat, for organizing the talk. And it's been a great privilege for Kriya to host you, Bharat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this opportunity. Thanks a lot.